Good afternoon, everyone. Namaskaram, namaste, wanakam to you all. My name is Dr. Krish Bhargav, and today I'm going to talk to you about adversity and why resilience is important. Just want to give you a quick introduction about myself. Um, uh, before I get there, I want to give you a quick disclaimer that I've not, I've been dieting for about a week to be on this stage, which means if I do faint for any reason, it's uh, you just have to feed me a burger and I should be fine, all right? So, uh, I was born and brought up in Bangalore. My dad was a government servant, my mum was a housewife. For some reason, I had a very petrified and a troubled childhood. I was worried about everything and anything. I was scared about anything and everyone. To such an extent that I thought uh, the earthquakes in Japan was caused because of me. And even... Uh, Bill Clinton's affair was because of me, right? That's how, I, how, that's how bad it was. I was being blamed at for everything. Anyone's failure was pretty much me. Uh, my failure was pretty much me. So my, my confidence levels were very, very low. I'll give you a quick instance. Uh, I was in about third grade or fourth grade. Uh, I'd actually broken my hand when I was at school. And... I was going through immense pain, but my fear had taken over my pain. So I didn't really tell anyone about it. I was so scared to tell my teachers about it. So uh, I kept quiet the whole day. But there was two things I was worried about. One was obviously my hand. Number two was that guy sitting next to me because both my hand and his face were swelling up like a balloon. He actually thought I was going to die. I went home that evening and my mother tended to me. I got myself plastered, but yet I got battered for breaking my hand. Eventually, I was detained in the same class because I lost two months of my schooling and, and that was, was, was one of the reasons that I got detained in the class. My confidence levels kept dropping and it really didn't get better over the years. But there was one person who always thought I was the most handsome guy that she'd ever seen. She thought I was the most intelligent guy that I've ever, that I've ever met. She thought that I, that I was a miracle kid, right? And you know who I'm talking about. It's, it's my Amma, right? She thought there was something different about me. There was a time when, over the years, when things started getting worse, I th somehow decided that... Uh, committing suicide would be a better choice than actually face the world. So I did attempt com committing suicide. I think I was about 13 at the time. Clearly it didn't work, otherwise you wouldn't see me here. But she was shattered. She couldn't see her 13-year-old kid co trying to commit suicide because of his lack of confidence. She, said, she made me sit down. She tried to boost confidence into me by telling me, it's okay to fail. In fact, it's the other way around, which means most successful people actually go through several failures in life. That's when I decided to transform myself. Right? I started listening to myself. I started finding myself within, within myself. I started saying to no, no to things that I didn't want to do. I started focusing on my goals, which is what led me to UK. I founded several companies in the UK. I worked for several large companies in the UK. 16 years later, and that's, that's pretty much my transformation from there to there. 16 years, 16 years later, I came back to India uh, to spend time with my one and only friend, my mum. And about six months' time, uh, COVID hit. And, uh, Unfortunately, I lost my mom to COVID corruption. And all that for a mere 3,000 rupees. Someone decided that they could sell the vaccination to someone else for a mere 3,000 rupees. That should have been administered to her. That really shattered me. She was really healthy. She was very vibrant. She was happy. She should have been here amongst yourself wearing a proud smile on her face. 
watching her son doing a TEDx talk. But she's not here. I was shattered. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. I almost lost a year thinking that was the end of me because the only motivator of my life, the only ray of light was gone. I wanted revenge. But how do I take revenge? So I decided to make everyone engineers and put money in people's pocket by doing that. Why? Because that's the only profession that actually pays on par with uh, inflation. It, it is the only profession that gives you independence and wealth. But where do I start? I didn't know where to start. So I started attending interviews. I started attending interviews. I attended 1,421 interviews in total to understand what are the questions that's been asked in these interviews. And then I went, attended training from Premier Training Institute to understand what's been taught to attend these interviews. And that's when I realized that these guys never coincide. Because what's been taught is not what's been asked. And that's the gap I decided to fill. Let me give you some quick stats. There's about 65 lakh graduates who pass out every year, out of which 55 lakh graduates go jobless. And me being an inquisitive data scientist, I wanted to find out what happened to those 55 lakh guys, right? I just couldn't find them. There's no data about them. Some, some guys are probably working in restaurants, some people are doing delivery, some people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing or what they studied for. And who are these guys? Let me give you a quick example. People who are training for UPSC, it's sort of a sin to train for UPSC because if you don't clear it, you have a gap in your employment, which means you don't qualify for a fresher. Number two, BA, BSc, BCom graduates. These guys don't qualify for an IT fresher role, which means when they get placed in another profession, they get a very mere wage of about eight to 12,000. BTEC in civil and mechanical they don't qualify for IT roles. And finally, people who are seeking to change the domain, who want to come from uh, teaching to IT, or any other domain to IT, or, or women coming back to work after the maternity, they don't qualify for IT fresher roles because they have a gap in the employment. But strangely, strangely, they all qualify as far as they have a six months experience of some sort. I'm not really sure what would have changed in that six months that hasn't been applied to them for over 23 or 24 years of education. Right? So far we've placed about 800 candidates, but we've not only placed 800 candidates, we've changed over 3,000 lives that depend on these 800 candidates. Right? But not just that. Any forthcoming generation's lives have been permanently changed for good forever, right? These 800 candidates have an average salary of 10 lakhs per annum, and they were people who were making 10 grand, eight grand, or no income for years. We have people from all walks of life, from housewives to delivery boys to cab drivers to freelancers, you name it, we've served them. So, I didn't stop there. There was a time I was in a traffic light signal in Bangalore, and um, I saw a transgender there uh, who was begging from car to car. There was something different about her. She was a bit more civilized. She was a bit more respectful of people's privacy. And I thought, there's something different about her. So I parked up my car to this site. I called her over, had a quick chat with her. Her name was Suhasini. She was a BCom first class graduate. And she had been on the streets begging because her family had disowned her. The entire society had disowned her. No one wanted to give her a job. So that's when I decided to bring on board nine such transgender women. And I can give you with 100% conviction that these guys would be engineers in the next three months. But how? How do I do this? Do I do some sort of magic? No. I stick to basics. Number one. I onboard them, I don't look at the background. Any degree, any gap, right? 
as far as they have two eyes, two ears, breathing, speak a little bit of English, two hands, no legs, no problem, we can manage. Number two, we build the most important thing, which is the communication. How do you communicate? Right? You, might, you might have the knowledge, but how do you communicate? We teach that. Number three, we teach them confidence because these guys are nothing but the cloth in the Dobi God, where they get battered throughout their life right, by their parents, by the teachers, by the society. So they've lost the confidence to face the world. So we build that confidence. And finally, I believe that you are what you eat, which means we give them a nourishment chart. We give them a diet chart. So we build the nourishment. Then we pick one technology. Don't be a jack of all trades. Pick one and become a master of that. So we pick one technology and make them a master of that. And then we test their knowledge on a daily basis because that's the only way you know you're progressing, right? That's the only way you know you're progressing. So we test them on a daily basis. And then we don't focus on the theoretical part. We get them to build applications. We get them to build websites. We get them to build products. Get their hands dirty. That's how you know that you, you can build something. And finally, we deploy them to our clients. And we repeat this process all over again. In the next three years to come, I'm looking to place or change or impact more than one lakh lives. And that's how I make India a truly digital nation and we put a full stop to adversity, poverty and corruption. Before I end this speech, I want to thank my beautiful wife and my two kids who've actually sacrificed their precious time with me because I'm on a mission to transform this country. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Jai Hind, Jai Ho Bharat. Thank you, guys.